Welcome back. I'm glad uh, you've tuned in again. I hope everything's going fine and, and is good in your world. This is the Far Middle Podcast, Episode 9, and I am Nick Deolius. Thank you again for joining. Today, we talk about urban centers, big cities, uh, what have unfortunately become the power centers of the leech. And I say unfortunately because at heart, yours truly is a, is a city boy. I, I grew up in the city. I've got a large amount of affinity for uh, the city and urban areas. I think in many ways, historically, not just Pittsburgh, but uh, but all those those big cities that are out there across the United States, particularly in the East and Midwest, just provided enormous opportunity, not just for an individual generation uh, that uh, were looking to, to make something of themselves, but for subsequent generations, for kids and grandkids and now great-grandkids. So many ways... The urban areas of our country were the lifeblood of, of what built the country and, and made us into what we are today. But now we've got a, an entirely different situation. Today, in most major urban areas across the United States, we've got this dichotomy. On one hand, you've got the, uh, the glitzy image vision that you see out there. When you fly into the city, you've got typically a multi-billion dollar shiny type of, a, of an airport facility uh, waiting for you that looks very sleek and very chic. Then you've got all kinds of high-rise uh, skyscrapers and a great skyline typically from afar. You can see photos of it at dusk, at night, and, and, and the dawn that look really nice. You've got all these different sports venues and entertainment venues uh, to enjoy concerts and sporting events at. So the, the big picture sort of vision and view image that a, a city presents is quite positive. But then there's the reality. And the reality is there every minute of, of every day for millions upon millions of residents of, of our urban areas. And the reality is a homeless epidemic where people are just struggling hour by hour to survive, abandoned streets, um, Substance abuse issues with regard to drugs or, or alcohol, graffiti. Uh, we've got a crime issue with public safety. A whole host of challenges that in the aggregate are being paid by the people that are the poorest and most disadvantaged in our society. So it's very much a regressive penalty, a regressive um, infliction of pain, a regressive tax, whatever you'd want to call it whether it's public safety, uh, energy, cost of living, opportunity, quality of life, all of the above, I would suppose. Now, these competing views of our urban area that I just summarized, you see that play out quite a bit. The most recent example that's interesting to me was coming off the 2016 presidential election. Um, Hillary Clinton was lamenting the result of that election. She had a very interesting quote where she said, I won the places that represent two-thirds of America's gross domestic product. So I won the places that are optimistic, diverse, dynamic, moving forward. Again, that's the perspective of the first sort of vision or view of our urban areas that I spoke to. But keep in mind a couple of things to, to counter that uh, assessment. One, the urban areas in our country enjoy almost endless um, subsidy resources funneled to them. Um, you see that in just about every urban city you can think of versus the rural areas in that state or the suburban communities in that state. And many times it will manifest with physical public works. You'll see a brand new sports stadium or entertainment venue uh, that is basically funded largely by tax dollars. So cities enjoy a lot of resource uh, thrown at them. And uh, like the Bible says, for unto whomever much is given of him shall be much required. That's certainly true. So we should be expecting more from our urban areas on a apples-to-apples -apples basis. The second thing to consider is that our major cities, when you look at their economic activity, it's not heavily concentrated in what I would consider the creator-enabler-server types of, uh, of baskets. You see, obviously, a lot of government. You see um, a major concentration of law firms, some obsolete forms of media like print media. What I've read recently had a, a great way of summarizing this. They said that in the post-industrial city, the city of today, it's basically abandoned production jobs that we normally associated with that area that, that drove and attracted a lot of the, the population and the citizens and the immigration. And those were historically sources of upward mobility, but 
Now you're looking at things like real estate speculators, service firms or consulting firms that are often global in their reach, um, things that are very different than what originally built and drove the growth of the city. And instead of what used to be supporting a robust middle class in these urban areas, our core cities are suffering a gap between what are basically two constituents. There's the sort of educated, professional, wealthy class that you see in urban areas. And then there is just the abject poor that are struggling and and fighting and scrapping to survive every single day. And it's that that second category of the the poor in the urban areas of our, our country that really get me the most passionate about this issue and talking about the root causes of what's causing our problems in the major cities across the United States. Those individuals that are are fighting each and every day to earn a living, to stay physically safe for for them and their families, to to make sure their kids are being protected and educated, to basically improve as best they can their quality of life. It's getting tougher and tougher each and every day because in, in many instances, the deck is stacked against them. I'll start with maybe the most fundamental freedom or, or human right that you can think of, which is the freedom from fear of being uh, not safe and the human right of, of public safety, of being in a secure environment. You probably have seen statistics time and time again that, um, that paint a very discouraging picture when it comes to public safety in our urban areas. The 25 most dangerous zip codes in the United States, unfortunately, they consist exclusively of medium and large size cities, cities that we've all heard of. Um, You look at Chicago, Memphis, Baltimore, I think also Kansas City. Those cities, you have a one in 10 risk of becoming a victim of a crime within a year. That's simply unacceptable and and quite sobering. Homicides, uh, in many instances, are out of control. Homicides are up 50% in Chicago in 2020, and that's coming off of an already high level in years prior. It wasn't like Chicago uh, was not struggling with a homicide epidemic uh, before 2020. They're up 46% in New York City in 2020, almost 40% in LA, and the United States saw the largest annual percentage increase in homicides in recorded history in 2020, much of that uh, being driven by what's going on in our, our major cities. What do you expect in 2021? I'd expect that these increases, unfortunately, are going to continue. And I think you're seeing that already. If you look at Chicago, the um, shooting victims, the number of shooting victims were up over 40% in the first three months of 2021. When you look at the first three months of 2020 and through, I think it was middle May, uh, the number of shooting victims in New York was up almost 80% compared to the same time period a year ago. I saw a number for the Bronx within uh, New York, one of its its most famous boroughs. The Bronx number, it was 150 plus percent increase for that time period, which is just startling. And you think about all those people and all those kids uh, that are subjected to that type of an environment. When it comes to public safety in, in major urban areas, sometimes the headlines they get the most attention are are the ones that um, the sort of capture the imagination the most of, of wider Americans. An example of that would be a weekend not long ago when a couple of women and a little kid were shot in Times Square in broad daylight in the middle of the afternoon. So that visual of Times Square, which everyone outside of New York City knows and, and can envision, and a couple of of ladies with a a small kid, maybe tourists, right? It paints that picture to make a a poignant point. And that's typically the types of things that that drive the headlines when it comes to safety in in major cities. But for me, it's it's actually not that simple or or not that uh, optical. To me, it's, it's much more underlying with respect to the more disadvantaged communities that live in, in these urban areas. And you can see that in the data. Uh, there, there is a pattern at work. And if you take the select few poor neighborhoods in major cities uh, where people are struggling each and every day, that's where you see a complete separation in terms of violent crime from the, the rest of the city and, and obviously across the wider United States. We can go back to some of the cities that I mentioned a minute ago to, to show how this, this data play out uh, in the real world in the case of 2020. Uh, Chicago is a good example of this. The homicide increase in 2020 was really concentrated in the Windy City in a cluster of eight of the 25 police districts. 
uh, that it holds. And those eight districts were mostly in the south side and west side. And that means that the individuals that were paying the steepest price that were the victims of this increase in homicide rate were typically African-American or Hispanic-American uh, citizens. So again, it's a, uh, it's a troubling statistic. St. Louis, same situation. Uh, 70 plus neighborhoods in St. Louis, 76 neighborhoods, uh, six of the 76 neighborhoods, which represent under 10% of the city's population. I want to say it's 7% of the population in those six neighborhoods counted for half of the 2020 homicide increase uh, that St. Louis experienced. Same type of dynamic at work. Philly, Philadelphia, same situation when you look at the northeast and southwest of the city, which are its poorer neighborhoods. Uh, this dynamic on the data, what is it telling us? Well, it's a new form of inequality uh, that we are tasked with trying to address. And it's an inequality when it comes to public safety. Maybe it's always been there, but with the data staring us in the face, coupled with the steep increases in homicide rates, uh, certainly it's, it's a crisis that uh, we find ourselves in the middle of. And looking at this to its extreme outcome, uh, and again, using a city, an iconic city like Chicago, uh, the most violent neighborhoods in Chicago, which are typically the poorest, um, twice as many murders per capita as safer ones. That's historically been the case. But recently, depending on which one you look at, uh, which neighborhood you look at within Chicago, some of those neighborhoods now have ratios that have expanded from two to one to 16 to one on, on a murders per capita basis compared to safer areas of, of Chicago. Completely unacceptable and certainly a crisis uh, in the here and now. And the left, unfortunately, time and time again, seems intent on making the situation in crisis when it comes to public safety in our urban areas worse. You see it with a lot of district attorneys now and the stances they take that, um, that are very much um, extreme and, and anti-public safety in many instances. Um, you see this with mayors and city councils, uh, certain legislation that is passed uh, time and time again and what is really troubling about all this is that, again, we start with that sort of two different views of our, our major cities in this country. The first view being that they're the shining examples of, of what we should all um, try to, uh, to, to want to be or to become. But the reality is, even though we've got all these things going for us, depending on what year you look at, American cities are posting homicide rates that are above a bunch of other cities across the globe that we tend to look down upon as extremely unsafe or dangerous places. Uh, cities that I'm talking about, Kingston, Jamaica, uh, Tijuana in Mexico, uh, Johannesburg in, in South Africa, depending again on what data set you look at or what time period you're assessing, uh, their crime rates, uh, their violent crime rates are actually not as bad as some of our biggest cities across the country. So we may be the most powerful nation on earth, uh, but paradoxically, our cities are far from the safest, and that should be some food for thought for all of us. Now, these issues that we talked about when it comes to public safety and, and crime in our urban areas, you jump over to something like infrastructure. Unfortunately, there's a lot of similarities that, that translate right over and not in a good way. In the book, The Leech, in that chapter on our urban areas, we quote a lot of studies about the impact of infrastructure inefficiencies creating congestion in our cities and, and how much that adds up to in terms of a cumulative tax on efficiency, productivity, lost profits for both individuals and businesses. It's mind boggling when, when you give that a read, how big of an issue that is. And we also talk about the New York City subway system, the MTA. And we pick that one because A, it's New York, and B, it's probably one of the largest, if not the largest public transportation network in the country. And C, the MTA, the subway system, gets a massive amount of subsidy and funding each and every year. Now, what's startling about the MTA, the first thing that it hits you with when you, you study it, is that it is an antiquated system. It is far from a state-of-the-art uh, type of a, of a public transportation network. The MTA uses equipment and technology from the 1930s. And when you do that in modern day with all of the volumes of, of passengers and commuters that you're carrying, um, it's going to be inevitable that you're going to be always constantly facing delays and uh, serious accidents, unfortunately, on that system. Less than two out of three trains reach their destination on time within the New York subway system. And there's, um, on a monthly basis, how many delays do you think um, the subway system posts on a monthly basis? 
Answer is 70,000 delays a month. Sort of unbelievable from a magnitude perspective. If you want to try to improve the subway network with new projects, uh, look out. Uh, New York City has been trying that for, for decades. Uh, the Second Avenue subway line is a good example of this. It was designed in the 1920s, and it was finally completed. The cost came in at $2.5 billion a mile. If you thought that was bad, the East Side Access subway line, it's still years away from completion. It's already at $3.5 billion per mile in terms of its price tag. So it makes the Second Avenue subway line look like a bargain. Uh, the Hudson River Tunnel retrofit project. This is a retrofit project, not a new project. For that to get going, and this gives you a, a feel for uh, the subject of a prior chapter in the Leach and a prior podcast, the, the bureaucratic deep state, the, the, the tentacles of government on a local, state, and federal level, how deep they burrow into any and all productive activity. But that Hudson River Tunnel retrofit project, it required participation of almost 30 government agencies and nearly 20 separate permits. Unbelievable um, amount of complexity and, and bureaucratic Byzantine structure to just get that thing moving. And it's not going to be completed for years to come, and God knows what the cost is going to end up being. And when you've got all these issues with public transportation networks, and again, the New York City subway system is just one example. You've got similarities all across the country, across our different cities. Um, other options that might come to the fore and are also, on top of it, the result of disruptive technology and disruptive innovation like ride hailing, they obviously come into the, the environment and then they just get immediate interest, demand, and attention uh, from the customer who is going to shift from maybe riding a dilapidated subway network or an antiquated subway system uh, or bus network and then shift to something that's much more efficient, more responsive, quicker, cleaner, safer, etc. And that's what ride hailing has done. And what you might expect is it got more uh, popular and successful in urban areas. It faces greater and greater backlash from the leaders of our urban areas because it's a threat to the entrenched um, sort of uh, interests that are, are looking to keep things a certain way and keep funding flowing to those entities, whether it's public transportation networks that, that don't provide a good experience or in the case of a city like New York City, uh, the Taxi and Limousine uh, Commission which is looking to, to preserve its protected market. The other interesting thing about ride hailing, I find it fascinating in urban areas, not just because of how it's challenged and just completely blown up the demand and the ridership uh, for the inferior options of public transportation, but also how it's been sort of a, an equality uh, leveler when it comes to inequality. We talked about public safety uh, creating uh, that form of, of inequality when it comes to just safety of, of citizens, particularly poor citizens in urban areas. Same issue was happening with transportation. Um, if you were well-to-do enough, you could find modes of transportation where you didn't have to put up with all the inefficiencies of the public transportation network. But if you were poor and working poor, uh, you had to get to work. Your only option, viable option, was public transportation. Ride hailing comes along. That gives you a completely new alternative, and it, it leveled the playing field when it came to people, particularly in a case of somewhere like New York City, particularly to the poor and whatever is left of the middle class in New York City that are in the other boroughs outside of Manhattan. So if you were living in Brooklyn or Queens uh, or the Bronx and you wanted to get to or from work or to different destinations, ride hailing was much better, not just in public transportation, but also better than things like taxis, which have a history or had a history of discrimination where they wouldn't pick up certain riders based on, on what they look like. So that's another interesting facet of ride hailing in urban areas. And then the third one goes back to the issue of congestion and, and surface traffic congestion. So of course, you know, ride hailing companies are, are very um, much leaning toward the left and, and they're big advocates of fighting climate change and, and things like that, electrification of fleets and vehicles. But what's really interesting is if you look at the impact of ride hailing on major American cities, it has increased congestion because it's increased ridership and traffic volumes. More people can access it and enjoy it, and they use it more often if it's a good experience. So what's happened is instead of pooling uh, riders like it was originally envisioned with ride hailing, people want to take their own Uber or Lyft and, and not share it with someone else, and that creates more volume of traffic. And it also results in a lot more of these drivers for the ride hailing companies that are driving around without passengers looking for passengers. It's been estimated that up to 40% of the time 
that these drivers for the ride hailing uh, firms are out on the road, they're basically cruising around without passengers. And that, of course, creates carbon footprint and a CO2 emission footprint. Um, you also see ridership, I mentioned this earlier, being reduced um, from buses, subways, public transportation, because people no longer want that inferior experience or option. So that creates a net net um, higher incremental cost as well as a, a carbon footprint. And then, of course, when you look at the speeds of travel within our congested cities, uh, they've attributed certain studies 60% of the slowdown of traffic speeds in cities like San Francisco over a, a five or six year period was due to the introduction of ride hailing companies. So again, interesting to see disruptive technology come to the fore. Um, it gets introduced into our major cities first and foremost. The residents and customers love it. It helps address issues like inequality and, and racial discrimination, um, gives more people access to, to wider choices. But then you also see a challenging and threatening the public transportation, funding mechanisms, infrastructure, bureaucracy, that creates a backlash. And now you also see it creating uh, new challenges that infrastructure can address like congestion and CO2 emissions. Um, some of those very causes that the ride hailing companies uh, are big advocates of, of being uh, zealots with respect to how do they address that. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out um, over time. The um, last area of infrastructure public infrastructure within urban areas that I want to hit upon is, is one that, uh, that I've got a big interest in. I'm passionate about. You know, one of the greatest things about the Far Middle podcast is I get to highlight some things that I've had a big interest in over, over the years. So I appreciate you allowing me to indulge uh, some of those interests. But one of those is drinking water quality, and particularly drinking water quality in major urban areas across our country. Um, we have a drinking water crisis across this nation. People are unaware of that because you can't typically see it. It's infrastructure that's hidden from us. And you assume whatever's coming out of the tap, uh, because it, it looks okay or it looks clear, it is indeed safe to drink. Unfortunately, that's not the case in many of our, our large cities. Uh, Flint, Michigan, we might be familiar with that uh, crisis that they went through uh, recently. My hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has its issues uh, with drinking water quality, Newark, New Jersey, Milwaukee, Providence up in Rhode Island, Portland out on the West Coast in Oregon. All these cities that I just mentioned have had lead levels in their drinking water that exceeded the federal EPA health limits. And most of these issues can be traced back to the infrastructure that is run by, owned by, and managed by um, sort of the public bureaucracy, the, the big government type of an approach. These are not privately run utilities. Um, that typically have a much better track record of reliable, safe, and affordable delivery of services. Let's jump over to talk about uh, leaving infrastructure, talking about an issue that I think is one of the top two most important items or crises facing urban areas. First one, of course, is what we talked about earlier. That's the public safety crisis, making sure that our fellow citizens are not being assaulted, uh, maimed, or, or murdered. That has to be addressed ASAP. The sooner, uh, the better. That, that's obvious. The close second to that one, however, is the plight of our urban educational system. This, this obviously speaks to the kids in urban areas. And our kids in urban areas across this country increasingly are not being uh, put into an educational system and a process that is arming them with the necessary fundamental skills of reading and writing and math and science. Uh, it's an abject failure, it's unacceptable, and you see it in the statistics when you look at competency levels of, of kids at different grade levels across some of the biggest school districts in the country, uh, which are frankly embarrassing and very bothersome when you think about what that's doing to a, a current generation of our citizenry. And you also see it just qualitatively. Uh, you just see an apathy and a, uh, a lack of caring, it seems, a lack of a sense of urgency to address this issue from everyone involved in the educational system to the politicians leading these urban areas. And I fear over time, as exhaustion weighs in and frustration weighs in, that the, the people living in the urban areas and the, the people who are parents of the kids that are going to these schools, they just become run down and exhausted to the point where they give up. So this is an issue that is massively important. And by the way, tied to this issue is also the assumption, this parallels back to uh, that top concern of, of just public safety in, in major cities. This ties into the assumption that the child 
will be able to get to school and within school during class and then on his way or her way back from school is going to be able to do that in a safe environment. If you don't have that, um, that also is going to undermine the ability to effectively educate and arm our kids with the requisite skills that they need in the real world. What's bothersome about this crisis when it comes to the public education system in our, our big cities is how much resistance you face when you start talking about how to reform or improve the situation to increase the competency skills of our kids. Um, you see that resistance sometimes in opposition to charter schools uh, or private schools or creating more school choice for parents and kids to, to get out of broken systems or, or districts. You see it when it comes to the investment that we make in education, where the dollars are going. Are they going to more focused teachers to improve class size ratios? Are they going to more technology tools for these kids to, to apply and, and to learn from? Are they going to other things, other interests, other special interests? Often it's, it's latter uh, case that's, that's being applied, and, and that's, that's a tragedy. And then sometimes you see this resistance from, from politicians and in public sector unions, public sector teachers unions that are more interested in other items uh, like staffing levels or um, what's going on with regard to political contributions and, and keeping uh, the political feeding at the trough going than they are about what the primary job is, which is making sure that the fourth grader can do basic math, the eighth grader can read, uh, the high schooler has competency in science and communication skills. So until something changes with respect to the, the core data, which shows we're just failing miserably across most of our major urban school districts uh, that are out there, then the rest of it uh, really doesn't matter nearly as much. It all starts with the ability to produce a graduate that's got the basic competency skills that's needed in the economy and, frankly, that should be expected in the leader of the, the free world that is the United States. You know, when it comes to... Uh, the situation with urban education systems, it, it reminds me of, a, of an evolution I went through. I, I used to hear that often cited view or statistic uh, that would say if a kid could do three things, there was a, I don't know, some big 90 plus percent chance um, that they would avoid poverty and, and find themselves firmly in the middle class. And those three things were um, to, to get a job upon graduation, any job, um, two, to graduate high school, and three, to avoid having a child out of wedlock before a, a certain age. So if you did those three things, there was like a 90 plus percent chance that you wouldn't be in poverty and you would be firmly in the middle class and, and up to bigger and better things. And I always subscribe to that, but then I started to think about it. And obviously, I'm not an expert um, when it comes to all the complexities with, uh, with teenage pregnancy. And um, I'm looking at the economy and thinking, well, if a kid wants a job today, chances are they'll, they'll be able to get one. Not sure what type of a job, but should be able to, to get a job if you seek one. But I looked at that third one of graduating high school, and I looked at it more from the perspective of not being a dropout. But I think that caveat or that, um, that third requirement of the three needs a little bit of an asterisk by it today because it's really not about graduating high school. It's really about graduating high school with the requisite skills and competency levels that you need to be successful in society and in the workforce. So it's graduating high school with good competency in math, reading, writing, science, all of those uh, different areas. And that is where the urban public education system is completely failing the customer, whether it's the student or the parent, and kids are not being armed with those skills. So if you look at the three requirements of avoiding teenage pregnancy, um, being able to find a job, and then graduating high school, but graduating it with competency levels that are acceptable across the major um, areas of study. The graduating with competency skills may be, in some ways, the most challenging or complicated of the three. And boy, isn't that a shame, because that is a, a very addressable um, problem if we would put our minds to it. Let's talk about the dollars and cents of our urban areas. Well, the ledger, uh, the credit debit ledger comparison does not look good. Um, the debt levels of major American cities are, are pretty unbelievable levels. And the highest debt-laden cities that we see in the country, it's the who's who of our, our major cities. It's D.C., it's Atlanta, San Francisco, New York, Denver, Detroit, Chicago. I mean, we, we know the names quite well. Just to put this in perspective, Chicago. 
If you're a resident of Chicago, you are carrying over $38,000 in city debt and city pension liability per taxpayer. So if you're a taxpayer resident, $38,000 per taxpayer resident. By the way, that $38,000, it balloons to $119,000 per taxpayer once you start to allocate debt that's associated with the city public schools, the county, the state, the public transportation system, and all the other debt um, burdened entities that uh, you're going to be responsible for. So $38,000 per taxpayer, which is city debt and city pension, but then $119,000 Per taxpayer when you include those, those other contributors to the, uh, the regional and governmental debt. To make matters worse, the leaders of many of our urban areas are going through a bunch of machinations to try to cloud what the true financial health and status is of their cities. So there's a little bit of, um, of, of mirage that's being created to, to try to, to cloud what the reality is. And this is nothing new when it comes to our big cities. I don't know if you remember the former chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, but he's sort of a a legendary uh, individual. He called out cities long ago for using shady accounting and uh, and shaky math. And the way he put it was he, he said they were using the shady accounting to, quote, obscure their true financial position, shift current costs onto future generations, and push off the need to make hard choices, end quote. Well said uh, by Chairman Volcker on on what's going on and what the ramifications and consequences are of doing that. So you can use deceptive tactics if you're a city to hide the true financial troubles that you're facing. But when you do that and you start to maybe lowball or obfuscate pension or healthcare liability measurements for retiree workers and, and those types of things, what's going to happen is that's going to catch up to you at some point. Math, as we said in a prior podcast, is undefeated. You can't beat math in the real world. And when it does catch up to you, you're going to increasingly be squeezed. And what's going to happen is there's going to be an inevitable cutting of services. That might mean less police, less fire, less teachers, um, less services across the board, crumbling infrastructure where you're not investing into the infrastructure that we spoke about earlier. But the residents and the taxpayers are going to pay the highest price. It's not going to be the politician. It's not going to be the bureaucrat that allowed this situation to develop. It's going to be the everyday citizens, the working poor, Uh, whatever's left of the middle class in our cities that ultimately pay the largest price. A root cause of a lot of this is a just complete leadership void when it comes to politicians, city councils, the bureaucracy within government running our major American cities. Um, One of the attributes, if you recall from a prior Far Middle podcast of the Leech Way, was its its ability to um, distract the citizens, the taxpayer, the voter, from real problems, real crises and issues, and create the aura of another issue, opportunity or crisis to to camouflage what their true intention was, which of course is not to make quality of life better or address issues or crises, but instead to continue to grow and and consume, appropriate the value of of others. Well, certainly in in urban leadership, um, that type of an attribute of the leech way plays out in spades. So instead of the mayor worrying about crime within a city or the city council worrying about the abject failure of the educational system of the public schools, or instead of the bureaucrat um, looking and and trying to figure out a way to cure and and solve and invest in our our crumbling infrastructure, or the debt and broke nature of the finances of a lot of our cities, or the homeless epidemic and, and the toll it's taking, despite all those real, clear, and present problems, that we're facing in our major cities. What do you see the leadership politically, um, bureaucratically, what do you see them focusing on instead? Well, it's the it's the mirage issues, as I call them. It's it's the things that are saying, don't look over there at that legitimate problem. Instead, let's, let's pay attention to something over here that we will manufacture as a, a crisis that, that takes a higher priority and needs a, a bigger response than those other more, more pressing and legitimate issues. So what am I talking about? Well, it ranges all over the board, but you know them well. Um, It's this issue and focus on being obsessed with climate change across our major cities, as if any of these measures or initiatives that they're embarking upon typically 10, 20, 30 years out into the future, so where the actual accountability of hitting these targets uh, when it comes to renewable energy, so to speak, or carbon footprint reduction will never have to be held to the current politician that's making the promise. But 
none of these having any sort of significant impact at all on the, uh, the, the global climate or the global CO2 levels. So this issue of climate change, uh, zealotry or renewable energy embracing the, the typical you know, optics of a windmill at the top uh, a building or on a lakefront in, in the city of choice, um, those things are always popular. You see an obsession with things like bike lanes um, everywhere. And every time you go to a major city, there's inevitably a bike lane uh, that's put in place. And the sustainable living, sustainable city idea, um, our biggest problem sometimes feels like we don't have enough bike lanes. Road diets. I don't know if you know what a road diet is, but that's a, a intentional plan through traffic light sequencing and the installation of bike lanes and narrowing of traffic lanes or eliminating traffic lanes to slow things down, to slow the commuter down. Um, and that obviously has all kinds of follow on impacts that are, are not positive when you get the congestion and the productivity issues that we talked about uh, earlier on, on congestion. Sometimes it's in the form of taxing um, surface uh, car drivers into and out of cities. Uh, Manhattan's famous for that, where I think Boston might also be um, thinking about that, where they're going to tax people that drive into or through their own city um, because they don't want to see as many surface cars. They, they have something against the surface car, right, versus the subway train or the bus, the individual automobile, uh, there's nothing that they have against that per se, but they recognize that the individual automobile is a freedom of choice for the individual. It doesn't get them bound to the public transportation system or the decisions that they get to make day in and day out. So when you have the automobile that's yours, you decide where you go. If there's no automobile on an individual basis and you have the public transportation system, it's the busway line or the subway line that decides where you go. There's a big difference there. Um, one favors the individual creator, enabler, and server. That's the individual automobile. Uh, the other favors the leech, which is largely a reliance or a uh, demanding that everybody has to use the public transportation system. Bike sharing, that's another big obsession across a lot of our cities. There's been some disasters when it comes to bike sharing in our country, but also outside the country. Uh, Paris, France uh, is, is an example that, that comes to mind. And then all these new public transportation projects, we talked about those with respect to the New York City subway system, uh, but there, there's these, these public works projects and some of them are public transportation, new subway station or a new stadium in the case of entertainment venues, uh, everything in between. And then there's recycling, right? We can't get enough of recycling, but when you look at the reality and the math of recycling, um, there, there's a lot to be desired there because most people don't realize that the bulk of the things that you think of when it comes to recycling aren't recycled. A lot of plastics are not recyclable. They end up in landfills or incinerators. Glass, in many instances, I know the municipality that I live in uh, can't recycle glass. They will not take glass. That has to be uh, landfilled. And the reason is cost. Um, a lot of our quote-unquote recyclables were sent not long ago to China. We were basically exporting our garbage. We were calling it recycling, but it was something very different. We were just taking it and exporting it to, to places like China. And then China decided they didn't want that anymore. They didn't want to take the uh, the barges or vessels of, of garbage anymore, which then changed the cost formula and the math of what was going on. And then a lot of recycling is actually a money loser. So, uh, But nevertheless, it gets a lot of, uh, of attention and a lot of hype. But once again, the math and the reality are, are quite different. So this leadership void uh, on our political class, our bureaucratic class in our urban areas, I believe that that is one of the crucial root causes of what's creating a lot of these problems that are blighting uh, our neighbors in, in urban areas each and every day. If you want perhaps the penultimate example of this difference, sharp contrast between what the politician and the bureaucrat in a major city um, wants to shine a light on and, and, and focus or obsess about versus the realities that are being ignored uh, that are creating crises. Probably the best example of this is in New York City uh, with the New York City Housing Authority or what's commonly referred to as NYCHA. Now, NYCHA is, is one of the largest, if not the largest, housing authorities in the nation, and it, it's a mess. Um, so whether you look at it from a public safety perspective with violent crime or, or drug use, uh, you can look at just physical infrastructure, roofs leak, elevators don't work, mold is, is quite prevalent, uh, there's an infestation issue with, with cockroaches and, and rats, 
Um, you can look at things also from the perspective of kids there on the, the public safety side um, when it comes to lead poisoning, big problem with lead poisoning that was severely understated through the years by NYCHA. And, um, and also just the way that the, the staff and the bureaucracy handled issues when they knew uh, that there would be inspectors to look at the situation or the state of the infrastructure in these, these housing locations or, or areas. The staff would turn off water to hide leaks, uh, would, would do things that would basically put the inspector on a route that would reroute them away from wherever a problem would be. They did everything basically to cover up issues that, that were obvious to them, of course, and that they didn't want inspectors to see because that would require them to be addressed. Meanwhile, well, you've got thousands upon thousands of residents in these uh, NYCHA facilities that are suffering uh, this level of quality of life. You've got the mayor of New York City who, when he takes a look at NYCHA, his opportunity that he wants to get focused upon um, deals with things like renewable energy or carbon dioxide emissions because his major initiative with NYCHA was to mandate replacing all the light bulbs in the apartments uh, with traditional conventional light bulbs with, with LEDs because of their efficiencies, their supposed uh, benefits when it comes to the carbon footprint. So again, it just shows you a, a perfect, but just a, a stunning in a bad way, a stunning example of what happens when you have this leadership void and how there's thousands of kids and thousands of citizens that are stuck in these facilities, these NYCHA facilities and apartments. Uh, they're, they're living in just horrible conditions. And you've got the leadership of the city that sits over NYCHA and it sits over the city in total. And the last thing that they seem to be worried about or obsessing about are those crisis situations that, um, that their citizens and their voters are, are having to deal with. Coming down the home stretch of uh, this installment of the Far Middle podcast, what is interesting about the study of the plight of our major American cities is that it is a case study to see what happens when the leech is entrenched in a position of power, when it can set policy, it has authority, it can set the rules over a prolonged period of time, not just years and decades, but frankly, generations. The culmination of that body of work is the current situation and plight facing our American cities and the millions of people uh, that live within it. To quote a, a literary work, our major cities today, it is truly a tale of two cities. You have two classes of citizens or two demographics. There are the poor and those struggling to make ends meet on a, a daily basis, and then there are the wealthy. The middle class is largely extinct as a demographic within our biggest cities. Um, that is not by accident. That is the culmination and the result of all of these policies, rules, procedures, situations created, procured, and furthered by the leech class. And until that changes, I fear, I worry quite a bit uh, for the demographic in our major cities that are poor, looking and deserving a better way of life, and have got the potential to really do great things, but it, they're going to see that potential um, derated, uh, bottled, shuttered because of the current environment that they have to contend with when it comes to our, our major cities. I want to thank you um, for tuning in to this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget about Twitter. You can follow me at Nick Deolius and also the website, nickdeolius.com. Always check in there for a new podcast or a new chapter posting or some new commentary. It's been great spending the time with you on this episode, and I hope to be able to talk to you again in a short period of time. Take care.